What's up everybody? This is Helena from Helena Plays Games and today I'm here with Justin. Hello Justin. Hey there. And uh, Justin is from Bad Cat Games and he's going to be talking to us about Gladiatoris. Well done. Was it good? <laughs> yeah, you're one of the few that gets that right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Gladiatoris was previously on Kickstarter. We're going to be showcasing a bit of the game later in the video, so stay tuned to watch how the game is played. And Justin, um, you gave it a shot a while ago, right? And now you're going to be giving it a shot again later this month? Yep, absolutely. May the 28th. Perfect. So May the 28th, Gladiatoris is going to be launching on Kickstarter and it's been quite a while since the previous launch. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the game and how everything started. And then we're going to go into what's changed between the first attempt and this one here. So tell us about how Gladiatoris started. Like what inspired you to create that game? Okay, so uh, first of all, I mean, it's a long, it's a game that's been a long time in production um, or development, sorry, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, it's It was way, way back when I was a student and um, there was a, a card game that we used to play. And um, what I loved about it was the fact that the cards interacted against the other player. So it was effectively like you were dueling um, between players with the cards. And it's okay. something I always wanted to play around with. Um, but always wanted to have a, a more of a gladiator theme. It just sort of seemed to fit. And this was way before Spartacus, the TV series. And uh, in fact, I think before the, the film came out as well. Really? In fact, yeah, that I already okay, had the Okay, so idea. you were like fascinated by the theme before all the buzz. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we'd seen sort of the original, what, 1960s version with Kirk Douglas oh, and yes. all of that stuff. Oh, you know, so we'd good. seen it years back. But um, yeah, so gladiators was always a good theme and it just made sense. If you're going to have a, 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 a duel between players in a game mm -hmm. then you know swords and sandals um swords and shields you know you, you can apply it to to all the different themes you know obviously a sort of medieval style with big heavy knights and you could do one of our plans actually is to take this further with a, a more sort of samurai themed game Ooh. um when you're playing um samurais or ronin or whatever you know but the same sort of uh, me mechanisms behind mm -hmm. the game will run but uh, yeah gladiators was the big one that just sort of seemed to fit the bill and once you've got something, you just run with it and develop it. Okay, so, I mean, you're talking about quite a long time ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so why did it take you such a long time to actually decide <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to create that? Yeah, well, it was, it was, it's one of these things that uh, as a designer, I've been designing various games for, for donkey's years, really. And, um, you know, like many, many people now that, that have started up businesses um, through Kickstarter, it's really only the fact that Kickstarter and crowdfunding became available that we all sort mm -hmm. of sat up uh, en masse, I think it was, and, and suddenly realized that potentially there is an outlet to actually be an indie developer that becomes a publisher, can actually publish some of these games that had been sitting on a computer in various files and, and directories for, for years. Yeah. So that, you know, just like everybody else, you know, that's, that's where we originally started. But Gladiators was, was one of those games in the pipeline. We have another six, eight games in the pipeline that are always at various stages of either development or, or, um, artwork being created for them. And some are still concepts, but, mm -hmm. um, so that's why, so that's why Gladiators is kind of, arrived at the point it has now, basically. Okay. Because this is our second game, of course. This is something that I usually like to ask to everybody who is both designing games and also publishing games. So these are like two totally different things, right? The one is like more creative. You have to uh, think of things and put them to the paper, test them and everything. And the other one, on the other hand, is it does have its fair share of trial and error, of course, <laughs> but it's uh, more about bookkeeping and, you know, trying to get things right. So is either role more fascinating to you? Oh, well, that, that's a really tricky one because it's, yeah, the, the two go together. The two, the two become a whole and that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. But, but they're both very, very different beasts. And, you know, there's a big decision, I think, between, um, being a designer, being a creator, um, and having a design studio and, and actually becoming a publisher and taking that next step rather than approaching other publishers with, with a finished product and yeah. saying here, you know, what do you think? Um, so that's, that's a tricky one really to answer because for me, um, or for us at Bad Cat Games, it's, it's, 
we have both options. Mm -hmm. we're, we're also a publisher and we intend to continue being a publisher, but at the same time, we've got certain games that are in development at the moment that we very, very likely will not publish ourselves, but we will take to some of the larger publishers because it just sort of fits um, more their style of game yeah. than it would ours. Um, I don't, we, or we don't want really in Bad Cat Games to be sort of pigeonholed free style for a single style of mm -hmm. game. Um, because as I say, the ideas that we've developed over the past 10, 15 years are all so different mm -hmm. that they, they are totally different genre styles of games. So, um, so our next game, for example, is not going to be a card battling game at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think as a publisher, perhaps it's easier to do that mm -hmm. because yeah. you, you're taking your own ideas and you're running with them all the way to actually getting them into shops, mm -hmm. um, which, which is a thrill as well. So I think that's why a lot of uh, indie publishers now um, are busy producing um, new games and, and trying to get them Absolutely. out there because, because of that thrill of actually taking it from the concept stage and running with it right the way through to the end of the race. Absolutely. So I guess that's your answer. It is. It is indeed. Um, so how would you describe the identity of Bad Cat Games? So what is the kind of games that you want to um, produce and what is the kind of impact that you want to have in the board game community? Uh, definitely. I mean, in a sense, we're, we're perhaps, uh, we're certainly a lot smaller than some of the, what would still regard themselves as indie publishers, mm -hmm. but they've done amazingly well over the past four or five years and they're producing games every year. Um, that's the sort of lofty heights that we'd like to reach at some point, but, um, we're not falling over ourselves to try and rush through stuff. Um, what's much more interesting for us is, is, focus on really interesting games that are really going to catch a certain part of the market, uh, a certain certain type of gamers, mm -hmm. and sort of say, well, this game is for you guys, and then our next next game might be for somebody completely different. So, um, you know, the, the whole range of different designs we've got, we've got sort of more sport-focused games, um, we've got some more tile-laying games, um, sort of resource-gathering Euros we've got in the pipeline, um, some pretty hefty miniatures games, which okay. obviously, you know, um, with a range of really good stuff that's been brought out recently, say in the last two years on Kickstarter, uh, you know, that's that's a sort of a level of of success that we have to try and aspire to, mm -hmm. you know, and we all know just the, how expensive it is to produce yeah. a, a whole range of miniatures for oh some God. of these big games. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, big money. So that's one of the, one of the future goals that we're going to achieve. But again, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not going to pigeon our, pigeonhole ourselves into a, into certain styles of sort of, um, keep it to, to small games, um, you know, small box games, that sort of thing, or, or, uh, sort of gateway games. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the interesting things we are doing is we're busy, um, working with a number of, uh, of, um, academics in, okay. uh, at the University of Edinburgh, in fact. And, um, we're looking at the potential of, of educating through games much mm -hmm. more so than's really happened so yeah. far. Um, you know, a lot of games tend to take a theme. Yeah. Um, or apply a theme to mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Um, or the other way around, have the mechanisms say, well, what kind of theme can I apply, um, to that? But, uh, what we really want to do is actually speak to the academics and they have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. They can tell us how the theme really fits in. And, and what's interesting is to sit down and say, okay, which parts of your knowledge can we take out and create the game mechanisms? So, um, okay. you know, something like, uh, taking, taking something historical, for example, mm -hmm. um, you can sort of say, um, okay, we can take that, uh, that moment in history, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. And how can we create something that's gamified? How can we, how can we create something that is going to be interesting for the gaming public mm -hmm. to play? But at the same time they're playing, they're not really necessarily even aware that they're actually learning about yeah. history or whatever. I mean, a good, a really good example is Evolution North Star games. Yeah. Absolutely love that game. It's so good. And they've done so well in, 
taking that knowledge and creating a gamified experience that, you know, you play it and you're having fun with it and you're not necessarily realizing you're actually learning as you're going along. Yeah, exactly. Because sometimes if you just have to play a game because it's educational, you know, players kind of resist and they don't have fun and they don't want to play it because it's like, eh, I'm just going to play it because I have to learn things through it. But yeah, if yeah, you... Yeah, I, I guess that's the thing you want to... You almost want to disguise the fact yeah. that that you, as the gamer the, or the player, is actually learning, learning things as yeah. you're going along. But we all we all enjoy learning as long as it's not rammed down our throats. So <laughs> absolutely, you know, I remember at school. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's kind of I suppose that's that's one of the main sort of mission threads we have at okay. the moment in the business. This is very mm. interesting, and I don't think I've actually spoken to a publisher who has. Um, that sort of mission or aspect to their mission. So it's definitely going to be very interesting to see what you have down the road. Yeah, yeah, what we can produce in the next couple of years or so. Yeah, then. that's going to be super yeah. interesting. Um, while this interview is going, you will see somewhere here <laughs> the social media of Bad Cat Games, and uh, you will find in the you will find everything also uh, in the description of this video with links and when the Kickstarter is live for Gladiators, you will also find the link to the Kickstarter. So back to Gladiators. Yeah, yeah, we should talk about that. Yeah, I think yeah. we should. Now that we've done all the introduction and now that we know you and what you're doing and what Bad Cat Games is doing, uh, would you like to talk about the game a bit and its theme and how it plays and a bit about it mechanic? Yeah, okay, so in a nutshell, Gladiators or Gladiators is, it kind of uh, seems Spanish in my head. I don't know exactly. why. <laughs> well, it's, that's that's the Latin pronunciation, I think, of of the the plural. So it's more yeah. than one gladiator. Is gladiators. Yeah. So um, yeah. So in the game, basically, there are um, eight different historically as accurate as we can make them mm -hmm. um, historically accurate gladiators from history. Um, and the the interesting thing about them is that very little is actually known about them, apart from maybe what they were wearing mm -hmm. and and whether they lived or died, survived or whatever. I mean, it's very, very basic information, but um, we have eight of those different gladiators in the game. They're effectively playable characters, mm -hmm. but it is very much a card battling game. Mm -hmm. So, or what we like to call now, are it's a card dueling system, because although you're all, you take on the persona of a character, uh, you get a set of combat cards, mm -hmm. and then basically you're put into the arena and you all have to fight for the fame, the glory, the wreaths of victory. Um, but uh, you're not just actually playing the single gladiator, you're also playing the gladiator school. So okay. you could play the game on two levels. And this is what we like with the games that we design. You, know, you can play them on different levels. So you can play just the combat game. Or you could go more for the uh, the campaign style, if mm -hmm. you like, which is where you're playing through different events. And in each event, your gladiator school has to hire one of the gladiators that are available in the what we call the star player market. So, um, but a kind of market system where you basically have to bid and outbid each other to be able to secure the gladiator that you want to fight in the next uh, in the next event. Mm -hmm. And then once each of you's chosen a gladiator or got a gladiator, then you actually become the persona of that gladiator. So that's your character for the next fight. And then you've got your combat skills, which are represented by the cards. And you go into the arena um, to impress the crowd, um, which is why it's called Gladiator's Blood for Roses, in fact, because, again, going back to the historical side, um, it was very thematic. Uh, or very, very much the thing at the time that they would um, have a big ceremony at the start where mm -hmm. they would present all the gladiators in the arena before the fights even started. Um, and they would walk around and, and throw down rose petals that were sort of indicative of the blood that was going to be spilt for yeah. the favour of the crowd. So we have that in the game. So what you're actually trying to achieve through the fights is actually gain as much uh, favor from the crowd, which is represented by the the rose petal tokens, mm -hmm. and then that converts at the end of the game into victory points, essentially. But that's what you're trying to do. Justin, I would like you to tell me a bit. What are the differences between the version of Gladiators that was on Kickstarter a while ago and the version that is going to be now? Fine. Yeah, so um, originally the idea was that because we had so many different um, 
styles and, and types of gladiators, the, the way we could change them, mm -hmm. make each character unique. Um, so we wanted to keep it originally to having the classic styles of gladiators. So mm -hmm. they all fought in a different style, um, like, for example, the Secutors um, fought with a sword and shield, but had a particularly shaped helmet, okay. um, which is actually sort of over the years, it developed more into a, a sort of a very smooth fish shape. Mm -hmm. The reason for that was because very often the Secutor, because these were like, um, these were not just arena battles all the time. They were actually um, sort of presentations to the public. It was mm -hmm. a public show. It was, the, it was the Roman equivalent of of going to a pop concert or a rock concert, yeah. I guess. You yeah, know, in, in probably some ways. was. Yeah, so, um, so you had sort of iconic figures that would fight the different battles. So mm -hmm. the Secutor with his fish helm would very often be set against the Retiarius, who was based on the Greek fisherman. So he's okay. the famous guy that had the trident with the three prongs on the end of his spear and had the big heavy net. Mm -hmm. So you'd very often find those two gladiators would be placed against each other mm -hmm. and they would then fight um, in almost, I guess, in some ways, a choreographed fight, really, because mm -hmm. there's no, this, there's a huge number of myths about gladiator fights, you know, the idea, all of this thumbs up, thumbs down, whether you live or die, all that stuff, you know, yeah. and, and hundreds of gladiators getting killed in every fight. Some of that did occur, but what we found out most of the time, these, it was more of a spectacle for the public. Okay. So somebody who's putting on a show, the editor of the games, would be paying perhaps anywhere up to 20,000 sesterci for each gladiator from a gladiator school. So the gladiator school, that's the gladiators that they have is their resource, which obviously they want to use more than once. Yeah. They're not going to spend six months, a year, however long training up these gladiators only to have them killed or taken out of action obviously. by a nasty wound uh, in their first battle. So actually, they tended to put on more sort of choreographed spectacles and there's stories of of famous gladiators that would very often present themselves uh, as a duo and they would put on a show for the audience for mm -hmm. an editor and for his games um and they would fight for perhaps an hour or two hours probably yeah, with an intermission it sounds in exhausting well. though if it's yeah. all choreographed right absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah so well sort of choreographed you know at least a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it makes sense. But uh, so so anyway, so getting back to the different gladiators. So we had the the Retiaris, the Secutor, the Mermio, who's the big heavy gladiator in the big helmet, mm -hmm. the, the one you always you recognize uh, more often than not. And then um, there was various others in there as well. But we started off with five. Mm -hmm. uh, because that was a reasonable amount because we have to think in terms of production costs yeah, so makes sense. we can't just keep adding in a huge number of different gladiators um, so that was the original five mm -hmm. but um, what we found from the first Kickstarter on the response from the first Kickstarter was that because we'd already talked about having specific gladiators mm -hmm. that had names and they were famous, that's what people wanted to see. That's what they wanted to play. Yeah. They didn't want to play some unnamed uh, Mermio or Hoplomachus or something. They mm -hmm. wanted to play somebody that was actually that actually existed, that was actually a real gladiator yeah. like Astyanax or Calendio, which were always two classics. The, there's a, a mosaic. Um, that exists of their, both of them fighting mm -hmm. with their names above. So, um, so already, and that's why for us, that's why in fact Kickstarter we find really useful because Kickstarter is a way to present a game that, that generates an awful lot more feedback than mm -hmm. we could otherwise ever do ourselves yeah. through playtesting or, or you know, going to different shows. So, um, so Kickstarter was great because the, it, we came back from that with a lot of, of positives and the negatives we could fix. So that's when we took away the, the five basic gladiators and said, well, let's start off with a set of eight different famous gladiators, mm -hmm. all fight in different ways. So they're all unique. They're all different when you play them. And, and as you play the game uh, a few times, you start to learn the differences mm -hmm. between the skills of the different gladiators. And that, uh, that obviously not only adds the replayability, but it also adds to the enjoyment of the game because you'd start to develop favorites. 
Indeed. And because of the fact that you're playing a gladiator skull and not just a single gladiator means that every round of the game, every event that you play, you can go, well, okay, I've got a list of different five randomly drawn gladiators here. Which of those do, am I most comfortable playing? Which mm -hmm. is my favorite? Which one don't I like playing? And then you, you naturally want to try and uh, hire those above the others. So then that's where the, the bidding and the outbidding process in the game mm -hmm. occurs. And you're much more involved as a player because you're going, I really want to get um, Calendio, for example, because mm -hmm. I, I do really well when I play that character. Rather than the sort of more standard way of, of you randomly shuffle the gladi, you know, randomly shuffle the characters you could play mm -hmm. face down and everybody draws one. Actually, um, from the first few, very few plays, like the first couple of plays, I don't know anything about the gladiator history, right? I'm not familiar with it at all. But the game makes so much sense thematic wise that it actually draws you in. It does, it pulls it, you in. It yeah. does, it pulls you in so much. And, you know, it makes sense. And this is what I really like when I play a board game, when the theme ties with the mechanics as well, that what you do mechanic wise makes sense thematic wise. And this game, Totally rocks Does on that. it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a thumbs up for me on that point. Already, excellent. So um, you said that uh, one of the differences is that you started off with five gladiators. Now you have eight. You also said that they added the replayability. Should we expect like something more in the future? Like, oh, like she does that. Like the in future. the future, you don't have to do it now, really. Not no, no. for this Kickstarter. No, no, certainly. But no, we do actually for this Kickstarter. We have a number of stretch goals where we can actually release um, extra gladiators because they come with their own set of cards, their own combat skills. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially a pack of of the character plus his skills. Yeah. Um, so we have a few already set up for the Kickstarter and we have another quite a few in the pipeline as well that we'll probably bring out either as a, as mini expansions or as or as add-ons potentially in the future. Okay. Um, because yeah, there's a, there's a huge range of possibilities as well in just the way that the mechanism of the game, how the, the different skills are generated for each mm -hmm. character every time you play. So as although I said that each gladiator has his own set or her own set of combat skills, mm -hmm. some of those are randomly drawn for each fight, each event. Yeah. So that that increases obviously replayability and, and puts you on your toes as a player in, okay, how am I going to deal with this? You know, maybe it turns out that I'm more attack focused this time than I was last time I played this character. And, and so I have to adapt my strategy, adapt my tactics to mm -hmm. survive the fight because that's what it's all about. Okay, so from your previous experience, because you launched the game on Kickstarter before, if you could summarize like three things that you learned and that you would have implemented if you would turn time back, what would those be in order to make the project successful from the yeah, first time? Yeah, um, I think the first one definitely would have been the changeover from the generic gladiators to mm -hmm. the... Um, to the, the special sort of professional gladiators mm -hmm. because that was that was feedback that we got from the backers um, and also from uh, continued playtesters as well. And um, it was just one of those things where there was various reasons why we had kept the, the characters generic, but of course the characters are the focus of the game. That's what you want to play. That's mm -hmm. who you're choosing. So um, we had these special gladiators, these star players, as we call them, um, lined up for the uh, as stretch goals and that sort of thing. But it just increasingly it became aware that, that that's what people wanted to play. So why didn't we include that in the first place? And you know, so that's it's just one of these sort of decisions. There was there was a number of different decisions uh, why we didn't go with with so many because you have to obviously present quite a few so you give the players a lot of choice yeah so by having generic gladiators of different fighting styles then you had more flexibility over uh, how their combat skills um, are set up for each fight so there's kind of that was one of the reasons but um, but yeah the the feedback from the backers and the playtesters was let's get to play some of these special gladiators mm -hmm. so that was a, a big no-brainer for us kind of makes sense because like you feel like you're playing an actual character yeah, and you know you feel much. like you're them so yeah it, it helps with the immersion in the game
Uh, that, that, that's exactly right. Yeah, it does. It helps with the with the immersion of you, the player, in the game. It yeah. also adds to the historical theme as well yeah. because you know you're, you're sort of you have a vested interest in playing mm -hmm. these characters rather than a sort of um, you know some generic person. Whether they live or die, do you really care? You know, in the mm -hmm. game, does it matter? So that was that was the main one. Um, second one is always um, to do with the amount of advertising and marketing and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff because it's one of those things that whenever out of 365 days a year wherever you decide to actually hit that button and launch you're still in hindsight thinking have we done enough um, is there other things we could have do? Maybe we should have done things in a different way, or or focused a bit more on this rather than that. And and so that's that's obviously a sort of overriding concern. I don't think there's that much we would have um, changed so much, but perhaps the focus mm -hmm. of of the sort of ad campaign and the marketing stuff as well. And come to speak to you, obviously. You know, <laughs> should have done that first time around. That's a no-brainer. Yeah, that's a no-brainer, <laughs> absolutely. So so we fixed that one this time. Um, and so that's two. What was the third one? Um, yeah, so because the game was focused very much um, about the, the combat, when we asked people, you know, which was the part of the game that you enjoyed the most, they would always come back that sort of the feeling that you're actually dueling with cards mm -hmm. you're playing cards and the opponent is counter playing cards and then you've got to react to that but you're well aware that the more cards you use up the other players are all circling like hyenas hyenas and um you know they're watching seeing what's going on because every card you play is vital in your chance to survive and stay on your feet and continue fighting so um that that's the major aspect of the game so um but what the other players thought was, well, you're also playing a gladiator school. You're not just playing the individual gladiators. And we'd actually designed this bidding system where, you, um, where you're choosing which gladiator. You're having to spend your future victory points in effect to, so in advance to hire your favourite or your, your, um, the best gladiator of the bunch mm -hmm. each time. So you're having to outbid your opponents as well. So that's something we'd designed but because the focus that, from feedback was that the combat was the exciting part, we wanted to sort of keep that as the core of the game. And so we kind of shelved the bidding part until after the Kickstarter, people were saying, well, you know, we'd really like um, the sort of aspect where you're more invested in who you choose. Mm -hmm. and, and if I want to play the Retiarius, um, why, if another player picks that, then I don't get to play that Retiarius. Mm -hmm. So... Part, it sort of came with the fact that we changed over to the specific gladiators because then there's with eight there's much more choice yeah um, and so the players are basically asking for something that we'd already designed so mm -hmm. then we would kind of trot it out and said well how about this and they said <laughs> yeah that works that's exactly what we wanted and we said yeah okay good <laughs> let's bring that back <laughs> let's bring that back and put it in yeah absolutely so that's why we will always say uh, the amount of, of, of feedback from players um, is so vitally important because they reinforce your own confidence mm -hmm. in what you're producing is something that they're really going to enjoy. Yeah, because absolutely. you don't want to create a game that people kind of go, eh. You know, I'm I'm very much all about creating something that players are going to keep on the shelves for years and years, yeah. and they trot it out whenever players come round to to play with them. You know, and mm -hmm. and Gladiators is is a kind of a game that you could literally play at the pub. You know, yeah, you can take it down the pub. You know, the literally. box the box is not that large, not that heavy, so you wouldn't necessarily play the bidding part of the game, that first part of the game, mm -hmm. but you know, you can easily take the rest of the game down the Absolutely. path and just like, right guys, let's have a bash, let's have a blast. And that's that's also an important thing for us is designing games that um, can be played on different levels. You know, mm -hmm. you can, um, we just had a, a review back from um, Tantrum House and mm -hmm. it's something that they said was they loved the fact that you can, you've got these bolt on elements mm -hmm. to the game. You can sort of say, well, let's keep it streamlined. We've only got a couple of hours. We've only got an hour or so to play. So let's just ignore that bit and just, just go for the, the fun combat mm -hmm. part. Um, you know, so you can sort of chop and change the different bits of the game. And I really like that as a gamer myself. 
Yeah, you, you can, can like tailor that. make it to your needs at the, the specific yeah. time. Yeah, and yeah, you can still have it. a full experience and have fun with it. So yeah, absolutely. Because I think that the the danger is that you might really love a more complex game or a more time consuming game, mm -hmm. but trying to get other people to play that when you say, well, you know, we want to play this tonight, but it's going to take half an hour to set up. Yeah. Then you've put people off and you've lost the battle before you've even started. That's very so, true. Very so true. it's nice to be able to design games that you can just kind of add in the bits you want or, or strip them out so that you can just play the core experience. Absolutely. So, yeah. And yeah. you mentioned that this is a game that you can actually put in your bag, take it with you and go play at a pub. Yeah. And you've got something over here that you can actually take at the pub with you. Yeah, this, yeah, this probably, <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. This you is quite, can. It's quite useful for putting your beer on as well, I guess. Yeah. No, this is not my <laughs> point. Oh, no, but it, it, it is waterproof though, so. It is, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it especially okay. had a pub table. It helps you keep things so organized. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, that's very true because um, it's a very card intensive game. Yeah. So and because you're um, you're playing cards against each other, but when those cards are used up, they go into a discard pile. Mm -hmm. And what tends to happen on small tables is all the cards start getting mixed up. People are taking cards from various decks and they all yeah. start sliding everywhere. So, yeah, this was an absolute no brainer. And we always, always take this to all of our demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And the, the gamers absolutely love it because it does keep the, the sort of central part of the table focused on, on the different decks. It just speeds up play as well. So, yeah. you know, why would you not have something like this? Is this going to be like the final quality? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, so yeah. This, is, this is a quite thick play mat, guys. And I'll try to show the thickness over here. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it's a three mil neoprene, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. a very good quality. And for its size, it's, it's quite heavy. I mean, quite heavy. It's got a good weight on it. Yeah, it's not yeah, like it one of those flimsy mats that you think that you're going to tear up or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, this should last for years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you also have something else here that you're going to have in the campaign. This is the first player marker. Let me just make a close up of that one. Okay, I'll... Go on, camera. Go on. Come go, on, camera. Go. You can, you can yeah. autofocus. Uh, no, oh, because no, struggling. you... Yeah, Stokes our faces are better. Yeah. I know. Oh, there you go for just uh, one second, yeah. but I'm going to do a better close up uh, that you're going to see over it. Um, this is a painted first player token. Yeah, they're not all going to be painted. Yeah, we, we'd be there. We'd be there for years. But uh, no, so the plan <laughs> is that uh, that is the, the model that replaces the active player token. Yeah. Um, it's very cool. It's about 70 mils in size. Um, and uh, there is one of the pledge levels, the top pledge level, the senator level. Mm -hmm. um, you will actually get the, a painted miniature as well. You actually get two in the senator pledge level, but one of them will be painted. Will be painted. Yeah. It's yeah. so nice. I really yeah. love all those blingy things inside games. Oh, abs absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I know mean, it's it, not it necessary to have it painted for the gameplay. I mean, it doesn't affect the gameplay if it's painted or not, but mm. it's so nice to have it painted. On the but table. it's also, yeah, it was one of these things that um, just made a lot of sense as well because in the base game you just get a token a large yeah. token but there's other tokens in the game as well so it doesn't stand um, out I it mean, doesn't yeah. stand out exactly and it's actually very important to have an active player marker so that people know who's actually attacking at that time because although I'm, i've been talking about it as a dueling game mm -hmm. you're picking a single target out of many mm -hmm. that are sitting around the table but that that combat actually flows to and fro so it's almost like you can have a group of five players and they're all sort of having their own separate duels with each other at any time. So you can pick one target and the next time it comes to you, you can pick a different target. Mm -hmm. So it's all, it's kind of like a melee, but um, it's for actual sanity of the players. It has to be you attack a single target. Um, so it's really useful to have a, a 3D model so you can actually, mm -hmm. or a 3D token basically so yeah. that you can actually see who's who's in charge at that moment so absolutely yeah so there you go it's lush you can find it in the <laughs> kickstarter lush, yeah. <laughs> uh perfect and how i want you to tell me now how do you feel that you're going to be running a kickstarter campaign during a convention i thought i think that's really cool actually uh you know i think it's it's obviously very useful because we can say to two players that come along and think, oh, this game is, game is fantastic, you know, where can I get it sort of thing. Um, and that's really good. But it's 
it's nice to sort of have that extra buzz mm -hmm. of the Kickstarter going on. We do actually have one member of the team will be sort of more focused on the Kickstarter and being okay. able to respond to comments and all Perfect. that kind of stuff as well uh, at the same time. But um, I think it's, I don't see any problem with it. I'll, you can ask me again like after <laughs> I'll the show. I'll ask you after the show because go, I don't think you'll have oh, had any sleep at all. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's uh, like I can picture you like all morning running around the show and then at night when you say that you're going to have a shower and sleep, you're going to be like on Kickstarter answering comments. And, more yeah. than likely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I kind yeah. of feel that this is going to be the case. But Games Expo is, is, you know, it's like the other shows. But it's, it, it does create this great buzz as it well. Does. So it's it actually... Does. It's actually hard to sort of come down from the high of, of being at the show and, um, you know, seeing all the games being presented. Of course, you know, running a stand, we don't have much time to actually go and play the other games. Yeah, but, no. but there's that whole kind of feeling. So, yeah, it would be well past midnight before any of us are feeling tired. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it will. <laughs> so um, you have all the people here watching the video. Uh, they might be watching it before the Kickstarter or the Kickstarter might be live now that they're watching us. Why should they go buy the game? Just talk to them and convince them to go buy the game. Convince them, right. Okay, so Gladiator is, is a very different card game. Um, it appeals to a lot of different people because you do have a strong historic theme behind it. Yes, there's been other Gladiator games that are out there, whether they're miniatures based or card based or token based. Um, but it's not just us saying this, but uh, all the reviews, you just need to look at the Kickstarter page and the review comments. Um, one of the famous ones was, um, it's it's evocative. Um, of course, I've forgotten the words now. <laughs> <laughs> just, go and, just go and read them on the Kickstarter page. But, um, you know, it's a very immersive game and it offers something different that apparently uh, has not been done uh, for a long time, that, that style of game that really pulls you in. And, and as you said yourself, you feel as though you're a gladiator. For you that do. small moment of time, you, do. you really feel like you're you're a gladiator in an arena. You're trying to impress the crowd. You're showing off and you're trying to beat the other players. And you definitely the enjoy glory. the attention as well. Yeah, everybody <laughs> wants a bit of glory. I mean, everybody does, of course. This is us like, enjoying our like 20, 30 minutes of glory and fame on yeah. YouTube right now, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. It is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Justin, for coming over here at my place in Newcastle. I mean. This is like crazy, super, huh? it's crazy, yeah. Thanks so good. much uh, for being here and for talking about Gladiators. People, go back to the Kickstarter. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye.